Mm. Right all the way up. Beautiful trail even yet today. Mm. Well, it's a perfect horse riding or or uh, cross hiking, country. cross country skiing. I bet Mission Canyon.
identity flows from the land that surrounds it. The wild and scenic Missouri River is the lifeline of central Montana's inhabitants, its people, its wildlife, its vegetation. Use and abuse of the river's surrounding land by overgrazing and the application of pesticides and chemical fertilizers adversely affect the water quality, which in turn affects the health of those dependent on it. The Missouri River is a place for solitude, wildland exploration, and nourishment of the soul. It offers a sense of adventure and a spirit of interconnectedness with our natural environment. The 149-mile stretch of the wild Missouri from Fort Benton to the Charlie Russell National Wildlife Refuge is the last 7% of the Missouri that remains largely unchanged since the days of Lewis and Clark back in 1805. Springtime in Montana. Sixteen students from throughout North America gathered in the town of Missoula to begin a journey, a wilderness experience. They came to learn from the land, the wildlife, and the people who live here. Six weeks were spent exploring the wild and scenic Missouri River corridor and the surrounding island mountain ranges. This was a time for education in its natural place. The rivers, the mountains, the sun, the wind, the rain, the birds, and the trees were to be our teachers. Along our journey were many opportunities to hike the canyons, climb the ridges, or simply relax by the river. Many days were spent in the island mountain ranges of central Montana. The Little Rockies, the High Woods, the Sweetgrass Hills are just a few in which we studied. Guys, look at her, looking good. The upper Missouri breaks and wild scenic river surrounding island mountain ranges offer an open book of geologic history through hundreds of thousands of millennia. The possibilities of non-extractive educational geologic exploration are endless. The layered sedimentary strata that are cut through by the river and its tributaries provide a colorful history of the land and give the breaks their characteristic look. These sedimentary layers include shale, sandstone, 
coal beds from coniferous forests millions of years ago and fossiliferous layers such as a perfectly preserved beach with both clam-like fossil beds and petrified driftwood that look almost as they did the day they were deposited there. Occasional igneous formations, such as the huge intrusion called Lombarge Rock across from the Lewis and Clark campsite at Eagle Creek on the Missouri River, Fortress Rock, Pilot Rock, and numerous dikes forced their way through the st sedimentary strata. These igneous formations erode slower than many of the sandstone and other sedimentary strata, leaving the intrusions and dikes as towering spires and ridges. The huge Eagle Sandstone formations are carved by the river into sheer walls and cut by creeks into tight coolies. The rain washes away sandstone, leaving natural drip castles and perfectly balanced sandstone mushrooms. This place is very sacred to the Nez Perce. Uh, in their culture, the ones that follow what is called the traditional religion, they believe wherever you're buried, everything you have done in your lifetime, everything you have consumed goes into the land. And this is very, very sacred Nez Perce land. There are 26 bodies buried here. They're scattered throughout the battlefield. So this is buffalo, yeah, because of the dew claws. The deer don't have dew claws. They lost mm -hmm. them in a race. I don't know if you've ever heard that There's a story. And the Indians explain a lot of things. Deer lost his gallbladder, and his antelope lost the dew claws, and all of this stuff in a, a race that they had. And the birds won, and that way man had the right to eat buffalo. Otherwise, the buffalo were eating men before that. And what you see today, now here's a dancing man. I don't know if you can see this. He has sweet grass in his hands. He has a V-shaped body, okay? See this, and square shoulders. Uh, many archeologists will attribute that to the Blackfeet. <laughs> and that would put it about 1750. Blackfeet don't come in here much before 1700, 1720, 1730, somewhere in that neighborhood. Now it is Nez Perce legend that this young girl that was there was the granddaughter of a man called William Clark. You may have heard of Clark. Uh, Lewis didn't fraternize with the natives. Clark did. York really did. Now, Clark had something the Indians wanted. That's called red hair. They had never seen red hair before. And anything that was unusual or different, they thought was sacred. York was a black man. And that was really sacred, because if you can be burned that bad and still survive, <laughs> you are a very sacred person.
Drifting off to the north to the Bear Pies. Fresh snow, late April. up the goose meat music this morning. Beaver, owls, the whole variety. Looking down into the main Bullwacker Creek, the Missouri Breaks, the heart of a 41,000 acre roadless area during the intensive inventory of BLM, which was left out of wilderness study area status by BLM back in 1980. Looking upstream. wild, remote country. The wacker going up for miles in a series of rugged break country. that many people get in here. This is, I mean, up there it's so extensive, it's obvious that most of the animals live over that ridge and back in the drainages. I mean, it's really been used a lot in the wilderness here. It's real extensive. The proposal for this kind of wildlife range is basically a proposal to restore some of the original wildlands heritage of this nation. Lewis and Clark came this way on the river, the first real Europeans to record an exploration of the country. By the time they'd reached right where we are now on the Missouri, Lewis noted in his journal that he was going to cease to mention the sightings and numbers of wild animals because of their incredible abundance. But suffice it to say that at one time in the big open region, uh, a season would support in excess of 5,000 bison hunters. So they went at it with a vengeance and by uh, uh, about 1889, the bison were gone. By the turn of the century or around the World War I, the elk were gone. Uh, the antelope were threatened, the grizzly bear and the wolf were gone by about that time. My proposal in 1986 was take this land, both public and private, 
and convert it to a wildlife range. Bring back the elk, bring back the bison. The predators will, of course, follow. How, how would it be managed? Uh, you know, conservationists have long thought, uh, well, you know, restoring, restoring some of these lands to wild status is a good idea, but what about the people who live there? They first came in, you know, just go around the, what was it, 1912, 14, that area in this country, George? Yeah. Uh, all of this stuff is scattered all over your ring. It's so much better now, probably, than it was then. Years ago, it used to be Birch Creek Yard. You used to have a place on top of the bench here. And Birch Creek, how come you settled in there? Oh, that's sage, but Yuri, he says, when I settled there, it was the prettiest grass you ever saw. But they overgrazed it, and sagebrush is an invader. And wherever I've gotten sprayed it and got rid of it, where it was burned, well, then things improved. The better we manage the land, the better the branch, the agricultural side of the, of the operation is, is going to go. We have, we have cattle, we have wheat, and we have a lot of hay. But if we've used the land, the, the carrying capacity of the land drops dramatically. Yeah, but they're BLM, you know. They're, they're under, just like any government agency, they're under intense pressure from um, environmental groups, they're under intense pressure from, from uh, livestock groups. You know, they're, they're caught in the middle. They're, they're, their mandate is to manage those federal lands. Well. There are a lot of different ideas on how those federal lands should be managed. And uh, the management criteria that was set out for, for the management of the wilderness areas, uh, we couldn't live with. Uh, it would have, yeah, we had, there were specific problems uh, that were major where uh, actually the, the single largest one was uh, the lack of ability to name maintain water developments. and they have failed to do this. When we went down there on numerous occasions, we told them, please check our water half, you know, drill wells. They've got all the equipment, drill wells, and they got labs, you know. We want our water tested, and we demand it, and treat these people. We've had cases where uh, little kids were in, in uh, waiting in the creek, and this one little kid just got in there, was waiting around and he was just in there for just a few minutes, jumped out and his legs was all full of rash and uh, screaming and crying because his stuff was hurting so bad. So his mother loaded him up and dashed him down to the IHS hospital. And that doctor said, well, if you'd bathe that kid more often, this wouldn't happen. Not only that, but when they, when they built that road, they used all the mine tailings on that road. So every time it rains, snows or whatever, all of that residue on those tailings is washed into the ground.
The antiquated mining law of 1872 has provided the framework for the legal exploitation of our wilderness, paralleling the philosophy of the expansion of the West. This law has put our lands up for grabs. It has fed the American drive for gold and wealth which has built our society at the cost of our wilderness. The law states, all mineral deposits in land belonging to the U.S. are free and open to exploration, and the lands in which they are found are open to occupation and purchase. This provides explicit legal rights for resource extraction at any cost. The price our land has paid is already too high. Health hazards caused by the ingestion, inhalation, or absorption of mine water continues to affect Montana communities. Mining affects air quality, contaminates ground and surface water, reduces wildlife habitat, and allows outside investors to control the treatment of Montana and its people. In the early 1980s, Pegasus Gold, a Canadian-based company, developed the Zortman Landusky Mines. Construction began without environmental impact analysis. The mines grew over the years, spreading across the landscape, covering the mountainside. The BLM and the Department of State Lands ignored evidence that the operation was mining dangerous sulfide ores and waste rock. The method used at these sites consists of a spraying a sodium cyanide solution on crushed heaps of low-grade ore piled on a pad. The sodium cyanide dissolves the metals through a complicated chemical reaction, bonding to the gold and separating it from the piles. This cyanide solution is stored on pads which are prone to spills, leaks, and overflows. We need to enact and enforce a more protective and aggressive policy of mining regulations. Over our six-week trek, we examined the relationship between the island mountain ranges and the Missouri River, and we came to realize that the river and the mountains and all of nature are undeniably interwoven. On the Missouri, paddlefish still swim, geese still fly, and morning dew still glistens on wildflowers. But already we cannot drink the water. Unless we as a people can find the greatness of heart within ourselves to consider a greater cause than the human cause, the river will never stop paying for our selfish mistakes. For now, we still have the opportunity to change our path. It will not be easy, and opposition to change, as always, will be fierce. See the secret of making the best persons. It is to grow in the open air and to eat and sleep with the earth. Walt Whitman. Time will tell. I, I hope the land can be restored. And, uh, I hope. I guess I hope your generation will be in some way part of that. But uh, think about it, and perhaps we can talk about it.
Stressed out, life getting you down, too much homework, is the boss giving you a hard time? Or do I have a solution for you? The river, where even the most troubling problems are put aside. Another minute. Float down your local river today. How do you turn it off? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Was it on? It wasn't even on. There's a natural mist. I'm 